You will find, if they are accurate, that their results do not always agree. Scales will give the same result anywhere, but a spring balance will not. That is to say, if you have a lump of lead weighing 10 kilograms by scales, it will also weigh 10 kilograms by scales in any other part of the world. But if it weighs 10 kilograms by a spring balance in London, it will weigh more on the same balance at the North Pole, less at the equator, less high up in an airplane, and less at the bottom of a coal mine, less because some of the earth is now above you. The two instruments measure quite different quantities. The scales measure what may be called quantity of matter. There is the same quantity of matter in a pound of feathers as in a pound of lead. Standard weights, which are really standard masses, will measure the amount of mass in any substance put into the opposite scales. But weight is a property due to the Earth's gravitation. It is the amount of the force by which the Earth attracts a body. This force varies from place to place. For theoretical purposes, mass which is almost invariable for a given body, is much more important than weight, which varies according to circumstances. Mass is defined as being determined by the amount of force required to produce a given acceleration. The more massive a body is, the greater will be the force required to alter its velocity by a given amount in a given time. Radioactive bodies emit electrons with enormous velocities. We can observe their path by making them travel through water vapour and form a cloud as they go. We can at the same time subject them to known electric and magnetic forces and observe how much they are bent out of a straight line by these forces. This makes it possible to compare their masses. It is found that the faster they travel, the greater are their masses, as measured by the stationary observer. It is known otherwise that, apart from the effect of motion, all electrons have the same mass. All this was known before the theory of relativity was invented, but it showed that the traditional conception of mass had not quite the definiteness that had been ascribed to it. Mass used to be regarded as quantity of matter, and supposed to be quite invariable. Now mass was found to be relative to the observer, like length and time and to be altered by motion in exactly the same proportion. However, this could be remedied. We could take the proper mass, the mass as measured by an observer who shares the motion of the body. This was easily inferred from the measured mass by taking the same proportion as in the case of lengths and times. But there is a more curious fact, and that is that after we have made this correction, we still have not obtained a quantity which is, at all times, exactly the same for the same body. When a body absorbs energy, for example by growing hotter, its proper mass increases slightly. The increase is very slight, since it is measured by dividing the increase of energy by the square of the velocity of light. On the other hand, when a body parts with energy, it loses mass. The most notable case is four hydrogen atoms, which can come together to make one helium atom. A helium atom has rather less than four times the mass of one hydrogen atom. This phenomenon is of the greatest practical importance. It is thought to occur in the interior of stars, providing the energy which we see as starlight, and which, in the case of the sun, supports terrestrial life. It can also be made to occur in terrestrial laboratories with an enormous liberation of energy in the form of light and heat. It makes possible the manufacture of hydrogen bombs. We have thus two kinds of mass, neither of which quite fulfills the old ideal. The mass, as measured by an observer who is in motion relative to the body in question, is a relative quantity and has no physical significance as a property of the body. The proper mass is a genuine property of the body, not dependent upon the observer, but it also is not strictly constant. As we shall see shortly, the notion of mass becomes absorbed into the notion of energy. It represents, so to speak, the energy which the body expends internally, 
as opposed to that which it displays to the outer world. Conservation of mass, conservation of momentum, and conservation of energy were the great principles of classical mechanics. Let us next consider conservation of momentum. The momentum of a body in a given direction is its velocity in that direction multiplied by its mass. Thus, a heavy body moving slowly may have the same momentum as a light body moving fast. When a number of bodies interact in any way, for instance by collisions or by mutual gravitation, so long as no outside influences come in, the total momentum of all the bodies in any direction remains unchanged. This law remains true in the theory of relativity. For different observers, the mass will be different, but so will the velocity. These two differences neutralize each other, and it turns out that the principle still remains true. The momentum of a body is different in different directions. The ordinary way of measuring it is to take the velocity in a given direction, as measured by the observer, and multiply it by the mass as measured by the observer. Now, the velocity in a given direction is the distance travelled in that direction in unit time. Suppose we take instead the distance travelled in that direction while the body moves through unit interval. In ordinary cases, this is only a very slight change because for velocities considerably less than that of light, interval is very nearly equal to lapse of time. And suppose that instead of the mass as measured by the observer, we take the proper mass. These two changes increase the velocity and diminish the mass, both in the same proportion. Thus the momentum remains the same, but the quantities that vary according to the observer have been replaced by quantities which are fixed independently of the observer, with the exception of the distance travelled by the body in a given direction. When we substitute space-time for time, we find that the measured mass, as opposed to the proper mass, is a quantity of the same kind as the momentum in a given direction. It might be called the momentum in the time direction. The measured mass is obtained by multiplying the invariant mass by the time traversed in travelling through unit interval. The momentum is obtained by multiplying the same invariant mass by the distance traversed in the given direction in travelling through unit interval. From a space-time point of view, these naturally belong together. Although the measured mass of a body depends upon the way the observer is moving relatively to the body, it is nonetheless a very important quantity. The conservation of measured mass is the same thing as the conservation of energy. This may seem surprising, since at first sight, Mass and energy are very different things. But it has turned out that energy is the same thing as measured mass. In popular talk, mass and energy do not mean at all the same thing. We associate mass with the idea of a fat person in a chair, very slow to move, while energy suggests a thin person full of hustle and pep. Popular talk associates mass with inertia, but its view of inertia is one-sided. It includes slowness in beginning to move, but not slowness in stopping, which is equally involved. All these terms have technical meanings in physics, which are only more or less analogous to the meanings of the terms in popular talk. For the present, we are concerned with the technical meaning of energy. Throughout the latter half of the 19th century, a great deal was made of the concept